building on yesterday's video about the fact that real estate is not physical. The reason, well, the reason why you buy real estate is not because of its physicality. A lot of people think that, oh, I feel safe inside this house. I feel safe that I own all these properties, etc., etc. And the truth is, is that you don't actually own the property if you have a securitization against it. And most people have a mortgage against their property. This is the thing that you don't realize, right? Everyone goes around losing their head talking about rehypothecation of this, that, and the other. You're literally rehypothecating your house when you when you buy a house and you take a mortgage against it. You have rehypothecated it and turned it into a security that somebody else owns, and then now you are basically renting your own house from that person, or you're renting eighty percent of it, for example from that person, and if you were to not pay the debt, they would take your house. It is a security. You can make the same mistake as all these people talk, doom and gloom boomers talking about, uh, you know, people uh, doing that to gold and all these other things and all these other assets that are out here. So property is viewed as I feel safe because it's like big and it's physical and I can sit inside of it and worst case scenario will always have this property, but that is only true if there is no mortgage on it, right? And I'm not even going to talk about the governmental risks just yet. But if you do not have a mortgage on your property, then it is actually safe from the risks of securitization, uh, which is you not paying your mortgage and then losing it. How many people during 2008 thought that they were safe inside their property that they owned because of the mortgages, the ninja mortgages that uh, everybody took on, the no income, no job, um, you know, mortgages, and they thought they were safe, and then the property got ripped out from them when uh, when the government basically decided that it was time to do so, right? A few people, a handful of people, less than 100 people in the world decided that it was over, uh, and your property got ripped out from underneath you. Um, and so, you know, the, the feeling of safety when it comes to real estate is Ill completely and utterly illusionary and given to you by the people uh, who want you to feel it, right? It is designed to make you feel certain amounts of warmth and certain amounts of safety so that it locks you into one place. Because if I can make you feel safe that you living in New York City is, is safe, well, now you're going to stay in New York City, be a productive person for New York City, uh, etc etc and then even when it comes to owning properties as a business right so i'm not talking about your own home anymore i'm talking about a rental property that you own you know people feel safe about it but you got to realize what you're basically doing if you have a mortgage attached to it so you buy the rental property you securitize it by having a mortgage against it uh and then you rent it out and now you're basically the rent collector for the mortgage company because if you fail to make that mortgage payment they're going to take that property and kick that tenant out no matter what's going on, right? So that's this is just the securitized part of it. And, and you know, people think that it's, it's all about the physicality of real estate. But really, the only reason that you're incentivized to do it is because it is a, it, it is a security that can be managed uh, by a financial calculator, in, in, in essence. Now, the next point here, and this is why I'm doing these, you know, two or three videos here talking about real estate and, and my journey in real estate and why uh, I decided to, to, to move over to, you know, to Bitcoin and not focus on real estate and my parents too, et cetera, et cetera, is because these things are important to understand. I can tell you all the logical fallacies of real estate and all of that makes, all of that, you know, can make logical sense. But in order for you to actually see what is happening and actually execute on it, you know, it goes a little bit deeper than just, uh, yeah, logically, uh, you know, you have to maintain a property and you don't have to maintain Bitcoin. Yeah. And then the conversation, the, the, the conversation always is, yeah, but property is actually paid off. Right. Bitcoin is unproven. Uh, property is actually uh, here. I can actually live in it. Right. What can I do with Bitcoin? So that's the point of these series. There's a sort of series of videos uh, and which is why I really need you to subscribe so we can help spank the YouTube algorithm to, to get uh, Bitcoin content out in front of more people that need to hear it. Everything I'm telling you right now is the same conversation that I had with my parents when it came to their Bitcoin allocation and their property allocation. And they, again, most people have said this over and over again. My parents, immigrants to the United Kingdom, uh, spent 35 years building a property portfolio only to find out, wait, 
35 years building a property portfolio while doing the right thing and sacrificing every day, day in and day out, only to find out that even though they have a bunch of property, even though the value of their net worth is going up, their actual true sense of being wealthy and rich has been taken away because the property has to be worth 50 to 80% more than it is it based on the amount of pounds printed, right? Um, in the UK, is one of the, it's, it's lucky, the UK is one of the countries where the majority of the amount of uh, money that was printed has still, has still gone into the real estate market. And so therefore, uh, you know, it's not like we have uh, the, the US stock market, right? And all these, other, all these other dilutions of where that printed money goes. The UK is one country which actually has and still maintains uh, a good, healthy amount of flow from the amount of money printed into the property market. So that's why the UK right now, you know, from a property perspective, um, has done well, right? But the reality is it still hasn't done good enough. Uh, and anyone who has a bunch of property should have a higher net worth than, than, they, than they do have right now. But, you know, the main reason or, or the second reason why people feel safe with real estate is that it is, is twofold, right? Uh, and one leads into the other. You can, you can take non-mark-to-market leverage against property, and what mark to market means is that the leverage is not marked, i.e. valued, based on what's going on in the market today, right? You can take out a 10-year mortgage, and it doesn't matter what happens to the interest rate today or the value of the property today, you will not be called on that. Whereas if you go into the stock market, the risk that most people face and why they can't control themselves is if I take a leverage position out on a, on a stock and that stock moves Let's say I take a 10 to 1 leverage position and the stock moves 10%. I'm now going to face a margin call on that. And most people don't know, aren't meant to be, and don't know how to manage that risk as that position goes from, you know, uh, gets close to its 10 to 1 uh, leverage. So, you know, property, you can buy a property in the US. You've got the 30 year mortgages, which is a great, great uh, innovation. Uh, but you can basically buy you know, uh, a property and, and know that you're not going to get called on it no matter what for 10 years or five years or, or, or 15 years. And you know that nothing's going to happen and that there are certain consumer protections. Whereas the, the reality is, is that the only way that's happening is because you're sacrificing your ability to move around the world for that. You are being trapped inside the country or the state or the city where you are buying that real estate because you cannot pick up and move that real estate. So while it feels safe in order to do that and, and, and not uh, take a leverage loan against it, right? Or at least a mark to market leverage loan against it, you can have uh, a loan that will expire in five, 10, 15, 30 years, but you're not gonna get called. You're not gonna get called from a banker saying, hey, tomorrow or next month, you need to make up this amount of shortfall because the loan has 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 dropped below its LTV, um, and that's one reason why people feel safe. But again, this is an illusion that's been created. It is an illusion because if imagine if most people's property portfolios, and I'm talking not talking about your home right now. I'm talking about your property business, your rental income business. Imagine if it was valued mark to market. Most people would not be able to survive through the downfalls because of the amount of leverage they take. But this feels good for people because, oh, wait a second, there's, you know, I can, it's the only asset where I can actually leverage and sit through the downturns without being a sophisticated risk manager because there are certain leeways put into place to allow me to do this. And that's up till now while property has been a, a good securitized alternative for the amount of debt that's been printed. What happens when that changes? And so the next element point of this is the downstream point of this is you can not only take a mark to market a, a non mark to market leverage loan against your property and sit there without uh, any short term headaches, but you can now also cash flow it right because people need houses. People always say people need houses. People are always going to need property. People are always going to need a place to live. People are always going to need this, that, and the other. That's all true. But what if they don't need your place to live? What if they don't need your house? 
what if they what if your house and your area and your state because of your election your elected officials in 30 years turns it into a shithole and nobody wants to live there anymore what happens in that scenario so it's all good well and good saying hey you got to look at your cash flow right now and you know people always need houses but what do you do do you really feel safe leaving the decision about what happens to your wealth into the elected officials, especially as this world gets stupider and stupider? I don't. I don't feel comfortable with that. You know, I'm, I'm, my family is very blessed because most of the property that we own is inside of London. And so from that perspective, London is always going to be a major player city in the world, at least for the next 50 years, right? Who knows what happens after that? But typically, London is always going to be, and it's always going to have a position in the world uh, in, as this world transitions, even over the next you know, 50 to 150 years, right? I don't think London is going to get demonetized um, anytime soon. So, so, but what happens if you don't have your property in London? What happens if you don't have your property in a prime city? What happens if the only reason your property is actually getting, being rented is because it's sitting in a place where there is a big factory and they have jobs. And then what if that factory decides to move, right? Right now, a lot of people in the U.S. are feeling benefits on their, on their um, obscure real estate because there's been this, uh, you know, this decision to move semiconductor factories from Taiwan back to the U.S. That's great for now. What happens when you get another person and says, hey, no, we're good with Taiwan and China now, so uh, let's move those factories over there or let's move them to Mexico or wherever else in the world. What happens when you realize that the cash flow that you are generating on real estate is you looking 30 centimeters ahead of you rather than actually looking 30 years ahead of you? Cash flow is not guaranteed. Everyone thinks cash flow is guaranteed. And ultimately, cash flow is not guaranteed because... A situation like, you know, the big flu season that everyone went through um, happened and they basically said, you need to, you, no, you, we can, we're going to put a moratorium on the rent. So you don't need to pay your rent um, at all. The government said that. You don't think the government is going to do that to you as this situation gets worse, as they need more votes, as they, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't think there's going to be another situation now that they've realized that they can actually do this, that they're going to do it again? Of course they are. It's now in the toolbox. It's in the toolbox. Oh, we've got landlords, but all we'll do is we'll just tell them that they got to not accept rent for a while and they'll just not accept it because that's what's happening. So a lot of people feel safe with the cash flow side of it. And I understand that because it's monthly income that's coming in every single month, et cetera, et cetera. But you're looking 30 centimeters ahead of you. You're not looking at the future. And if you want a position for your children in the future of this world, you need to look at the future, not the 30 centimeters ahead of you. So there's, again, the two downstream effects here is, number one, you can get a non-mark-to-market leverage product so people feel comfortable borrowing against your house more than anything else, which is quite interesting, right? People feel, people feel scared about securitizing uh, another asset that is an arm's length asset, like a stock portfolio, but you feel completely comfortable securitizing the house that you're living in. How does that make any sense? For me, I don't own a personal house at this point. However, within the next you know, three to five years, as I start uh, thinking about building a family, et cetera, et cetera, I will own a home, maybe even more than one. However, it will not have a mortgage attached to it, and it will be secured and protected with legal structures to make sure that that little kingdom cannot be taken no matter what. That is a, I feel comfortable with that, right? Because there is certain laws, it would be in certain jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera. But do I feel, so, but I, I don't understand because most people feel so comfortable securitizing their home and putting their home in the, in the hands of bankers. And this is where your children are playing. This is where your, where your family is growing. This is where, this is where you form the confidence to go and attack the world in the way that you want it. And a lot of people feel extremely comfortable. <clears throat> a lot of people feel extremely comfortable securitizing that, but they don't want to take 
the energy and the effort that it takes to learn how to securitize an arm's length asset like a stock portfolio. You feel very safe doing one and you feel very risky doing the other. And I would implore you to realize that you have been conditioned to feel this way. It is normalized now for everybody to have a mortgage on their home. That wasn't normalized when my granddad moved to the United Kingdom because he was kicked out of Africa. It wasn't normal. You didn't, not everyone had to have uh, a mortgage on their home. That is normalized now. Uh, obviously, we've seen income levels as a percentage of, of the amount of money that you can borrow, uh, the, as a multiple of the amount of money you can borrow also go, go up too. Right, you started off borrowing five times your income, ten times your income, twenty times your income, and then there was no income, no job. Doesn't matter. Mortgages. So a lot of people have been conditioned, and and I would I want to implore you to think about why you feel safe from cash flow that is completely dictated by somebody else, and is completely in the control of an elected official that you don't have a single say in. Like okay, yeah, you're living in a democracy right so you know you've got to live there and you've got to go okay i just accept that i get fucked right now how does that make any sense right so if you're sitting there and you've got a property portfolio don't you think that it might be time if this new and emerging asset is happening that is being financialized is being accepted financial times today in the in the uk came out and said you know everything's been thrown at this thing I'm summarizing. Everything's been thrown at this thing. So even the most skeptical investors probably should have a small allocation. Don't you think it's worth thinking, hey, I've got all this property. And sure, right now in the 30 centimeters ahead of me, it's paying me cash flow. It's going up. I'm fine. But what if one day it doesn't? What if one day it doesn't? Don't you think it's time for you to start considering the idea that something else might be able to actually help you? might be able to actually w work for you? Don't you think that you owe it to the people that came before you? Like my granddad and my dad who came to the United Kingdom and decided to buy a house and then houses, they saw the foresight for me and it's my duty to see the foresight for my children and my grandchildren. Don't you think it's important to say, hey, maybe I can go a small percentage into Bitcoin. Because remember, my the house that I grew up in, right? My granddad bought it, I think, for 5,000 pounds at the time. And today it's probably worth somewhere in the region of 500 to 600,000 pounds. So we're not talking about a big allocation here, right? We're not talking about, at this point, a big allocation, especially with Bitcoin. Of course, as a percentage, it was bigger back in the day, but it's certainly not, you know, at the multiples of price that it's appreciated. But the point I'm making is, don't you think it's worth thinking maybe the cash flow is good for now, but will the cash flow be good for 30 years down the line? Maybe the mark to mark, the non mark to market leverage product that I have attached and the fact that I feel comfortable securitizing this home, maybe that's wrong. Why do I feel so comfortable handing over the control? Because that's what you do when you securitize an asset, right? When you buy the Bitcoin ETF versus the Bitcoin, you're handing over the control of that Bitcoin to the ETF manager. Same thing. Why do I feel comfortable handing over the control of this asset to a bank, to a, uh, an institution that is controlled by the government and works hand in hand with the government in order to... In, in order to convince me that this is a good idea. Wouldn't it feel safer to have a little bit of assets that I actually control? I'm not saying everyone's going to dump their real estate. That's not what I'm saying at all, because that is a, is a different conversation. I understand the sentimental values of real estate, and I'm going to talk about that in my next video, which is why I need you to subscribe to this. But I understand the fact that real estate makes you feel safe. And I'm not saying you need to get rid of it. All I'm saying is be smart like my parents did. And well, my parents had me, right? So that therefore that so that that takes them to a, you know, different level of intelligence. But um well now you have me, I guess, through YouTube. So what what I did with my parents was figure out a way to to utilize the real estate portfolio 
and figure out how to take what they've built and extract a little bit and put it into this new thing that isn't as secure, isn't as stable, isn't as accepted right now, but it's certainly trending in that direction when you look at the amount of banks that are accepting it, the ETF that's coming and everything else. And now they feel good. They, they will have basically, when Bitcoin hits $100,000, they will have doubled the value, the total value of their real estate portfolio uh, within a five-year window. The real estate portfolio that took them 35 years to build. As soon as Bitcoin hits $100,000, they'll have doubled the value of that and it's liquid. They can move it around the world at a blink of an eye. They're not tied to the United Kingdom anymore. This is freedom. This is true freedom. So here's the point. Ultimately, I'll summarize with this. The two things that make people feel safe with real estate is the fact that you can take a non-mark-to-market leverage loan against it. And number two, that you can rent it out to generate a cash flow. Now, here's the thing that you're giving up when you're rent renting it out to generate a cash flow. You are giving up the ability to have the capital appreciation because it cannot go up as fast because the cash flow has to keep up. So generally speaking, you take, you take a balance of the two, which is what real estate has provided most people. For example, with the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ generates a higher return than the S&P because the NASDAQ doesn't pay the dividends that the S&P pays because the NASDAQ is, or the companies in the NASDAQ are reinvesting those dividends for growth. Whereas real estate has been one thing that's given you an average of both. So you are, with, with real estate, the ability to cash flow sounds good, but you're only looking 30 centimeters ahead of you because at any time, at any moment, a government like they have already proven can come in and say, you're no longer accepting rents and if you do, it's illegal. If you don't think that happened, go, go look up the mortgage, mor uh, the rental moratoriums that happened during the flu season. You know which flu season I'm talking about. So cash flow, again, it feels reliable because it's coming, in, coming into your bank account, but it's not truly reliable. You're not in control of it. And the only reason that most people got involved in property is to make money and have some fucking control. And unfortunately, it's being taken away from you because if they don't take it away from you, the peasants will revolt. So if you're someone who's wealthy and has been wealthy for 30 years, 35 years because of real estate, you need to realize, unfortunately, real estate is not going to continue going up at the pace at which it has done, because otherwise the governments will, fate, will face rev revolution. They cannot afford it. Therefore, you will be sacrificed. And if you want to not be sacrificed, the best thing that you can do, start figuring out, maybe there's something in the future that's coming. Maybe the Bitcoin that's coming is a smart thing. Maybe the fact that BlackRock has put its stamp on it, the SEC is about to put its stamp on it, every institution in the world is about to put their stamp on it, maybe I should consider getting a little bit. I'm not saying all, I'm not saying you gotta dump your property portfolio. What I am saying is, if you want your children and, their grand, and your grandchildren's names to matter based on the wealth that you have built, it is time to stop being scared and time to figure out how you might want to pivot a little bit to allow them the freedom that you have received through real estate. But ultimately, despite all of this, there are still only three rules to Bitcoin. It's step number one, you buy Bitcoin. Step number two, you shut the fuck up. And step number three, you get fabulously wealthy.